everyone. I just want to talk a little bit about form and counterform as you're working on the type exercise one. I've seen a few people that have already started to turn this in, um, and there's some good stuff. So uh, I just want to run through the importance of uh, form and counterform or positive and negative space as it relates to type, because typography at the end of the day has as much to do with spacing as it does uh, the type itself. I mean, in some ways, some people would say typography is really about space more than anything. I mean, obviously you have styles that are connected to the typefaces that are selected, and that has a lot of influence on the aesthetic of any project that you're working on. But ultimately, it's it's how that typeface is used. Ultimately, you know what? I mean, depends on, doesn't matter what it is. If it's, if it's a nice typeface, ty nice typeface and it's not used well, um, it doesn't matter how, well, how nice the typeface is, right? And as we know, there are a lot of, you know, half-baked typefaces out there. Um, so, you know, learning to select type is in and of itself an important skill. Uh, but I think, you know, really at the end of the day, I mean, you could argue that, um, you know, even if you stuck to 10 to 15 typefaces, um, you know, for the most part, you, and learn to use them really well, you would be fine. Of course, you're going to use some specific typefaces for certain projects and uh, and that's great but ultimately it's how you work with them so in this case I want to talk about space in particular um, you know we tend to think of negative space as you know positive space negative space and we think of the white space as the positive space and or the white space as the negative space and the and the black space as the positive so in the case of type you know the, the letters the black letters if they're black are the positive and the negative space is the negative um, you know there are other schools of thought on that whichever element is the most active whether it's the white or the black it can become either the positive or negative space and type when it comes down to the design of the typeface we typically will talk about form and counterform because the form is the typeface itself and the counterform is the negative space built in around it and there's this there's as much thought given to the negative space or the counterform as there is the positive okay if you think about it in some of these aphorisms here this is from the Tao Te Ching here it's all about the idea of you've maybe heard this before it's you know the, the, from clay pots are made but it's the emptiness inside that in, emptiness inside that makes them the essence of the of the vessel whatever that vessel is spokes on a wheel okay same thing um, so i just want to this this is a book from a page called typography by emil ruder which was a seminal book for me if you get a chance to to find it or buy it uh, it's back in print which is um, i'm happy about um, essentially, like we were saying here, the type designer is consistently balancing form and counterform. Okay? For example, here, this is not unlike what you're doing for exercise one to a degree, but this is a you know, variety of different typefaces, and instead of looking at the, the form itself, we're looking at the counterform you know, called out. So you can see the importance of uh, a well-drawn counterform. And while you can see that these are you know, varying typefaces, it's... Um, it's, it shows you also the negative space, it, how crucial it is. You can still get a, a feel for something, even if we're looking at just the counterform. Okay, we can get a sense of the, the characteristic of the typeface, for example. Is it classic and serif? Is it a little heavier serif, like something like this here? You know, more of a slab serif typeface versus a you know kind of a cleaner, uh, older style or transitional style serif. Um, is it a sans serif, as we see in some of these here? So particularly this C and this S, for example. Okay, so the counterform is the reason we want to talk about it too is it's also a design element. So sometimes these things that are right under our noses can easily be um, looked looked. You know, we can look past them or look be, you know overlook them, I should say, and miss opportunities to use uh, some visual elements that could be really interesting and dynamic. Um, here, this bottom section, this is a typeface called Meridian uh, by the, the designer Adrian Frutiger. He designed a typeface called Frutiger. He also designed a typeface called the Universe, which is an extensive sans serif typeface family. Um, and this one, he's, they're just essentially trying to show you how a well designed counterform can still have a, a feel um, or can still convey a feel for the typeface itself. Here, this very clean, modern. Um, typeface designed by Frutiger. Here's a um, a cover for a magazine called Print, and this magazine is I might still be online. It's gone out of print, uh, but it was around for years. Um, and here's an, an issue from '66, where the 
uh, cover, we're, we're looking at a crop of the cover, is essentially just type, and it's actually just the counter form of the type. Okay, um, just a, you know, it shows you what you can, you know, how minimal you can go and still convey something. This is more experimental. It's essentially we're here. We're dealing with the the um, medium of metal or wood type in a letterpress context. Um, and you're saying, where's the type? I don't see type. Well, these are actually uh, elements called uh, furniture, and they were used to lock up either metal or wood type in a letterpress context, something like this. You can see the furniture used here, okay? In this case, we have metal type set getting set up for, um, for letterpress. You would ink this and then uh, print it on, the, on whatever it's being printed on, okay? And so these, these uh, elements here are inked. And when pushed to, you know, composed and then inked and printed, you can see while the positive elements are indeed part of the composition and an important one, it's the negative space that really activates it and becomes almost more visually central um, in the design. Okay, so sometimes it's not even type; it's the things around type that can give us interesting ideas um, from a visual creative standpoint. Here's a, one of the one from the golden era of, in my mind, um, album cover designs, particularly in the jazz um, realm. This isn't necessarily from the jazz realm, but in the 50s and 60s, you started to see some real type play as uh, the ability to work with different types of um, uh, formats became, gave the, the designer a little more flexibility. And in this case, for the album title Vibrations, you can see that it's the type itself. The character of the typeface itself is pretty neutral. It's really how the typeface is used and ultimately how the negative space or how the counterform in this situation is used. And, and again, like we said earlier, is the, is the white here the negative space or the positive space because it's more active? Um, you know, I, I, I'm just saying here primarily it's the counterform, which is the negative space that really activates and creates this sense of movement. Okay. This is kind of a, a cheaper version of a uh, Something like this, this is uh, the Blue Note record label that uh, started in the 30s, but had its heyday in the 50s and 60s. And a, a big part of their, um, they had a great catalog. Uh, so, I mean, iconic albums are on that label. But they also had a designer named Reed Miles, who was incredible and experimental for the time and doing a lot of new things with type. Uh, here, the album Vertigo by Jackie McLean. You can see the type play in here by slicing things up and shifting them around. And the typeface itself, again, pretty neutral. That's how the designer is using it that creates the idea. And ultimately, the negative space in this situation or the counterform has as much to do with the composition as the, the, uh, the form itself. A nice interplay of positive and negative here, form and counterform. Okay, just a simple visual example. This is um, Chermayev and Geismar, an agency that, um, again, had its heydays in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, even into the 80s. Um, and just a very nice type. You can, if you really start to, you know, look at the three here and you tweak your eye a little bit, the, the form and counterform really start to, to shift. And so, you know, again, a very powerful visual tool you have even when it's just type. Okay, so sometimes we're dealing with a limited amount of content, limited imagery, limited design elements, type alone can be a very powerful design element, okay? If we consider that, that uh, we consider all the possibilities. Some logos and typographic treatments here, the one above, you know, FedEx is a, I think a case study in form and counter form. Um, for years, it was called Federal, it's Federal Express. It was completely written out, that whole word in a kind of a clunky lockup. And it was always called FedEx for short, so when they finally rebranded it as FedEx, um, a seemingly simple system is an incredibly well-considered and well-designed um, identity system. Very simple, almost Futura, heavier Futura-esque typeface. Um, but it's, you know, the fact that this thing can work in a, in, it can be embroidered on a driver's shirt, it can be on a, on a business card, it can be on the side of a Semi truck or the side of an airplane, and it's still going to hold up, and it's still going to have, uh, you know, the visual integrity that, that it needs to work across a variety of media. And you know, the 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 arrow in FedEx, which is very well known now, um, for years it wasn't known. You know, the, that arrow between the E and the X. Now it's easy to say like, oh, that's there it is. It's so simple. That wasn't a, a totally simple and easy thing to do. That there's some craft in there, uh, and there was again that idea of like, hey. 
if I don't look at it closely and really consider both the form and the counterform, I might miss some opportunities, okay? And that arrow in the early days of this redesign got people talking, and when someone knew about the arrow between the E and the X, they would tell their friend when, a, you know, when the truck was driving by and they were in the car together, they would start to say, hey, see the arrow be in FedEx? And people would say, I don't see the arrow in FedEx. And you'd point it out to them and they'd be like, oh, there it is, oh my gosh. And then they would tell their friends. And that's just an, a genius uh, way to um, create some really quick brand equity um, through just even via word of mouth. Even They were an established company by then. But just some, um, some more um, uh, expressive examples of type using uh, you know, positive and negative space, the idea of shift here, the up and down, the H is implied. Uh, the blade you know, done here in the counterform, the A is implied. You know, really simple <clears throat> little tweaks to the typeface that uh, you know have a big impact and create new meaning in a way. Um, here, you know, this is this is tricky when you get into this is maybe a going out on a limb here. The idea of the U being created here. Um, you know, there's there's an if we, sometimes if we go too far with form and counterform, we might risk losing people. But at the same time, if we get that ha ha moment. Maybe it's worth the risk. You know, whether or not this is successful, you have to be the judge. A couple more examples. I mean, here you see in this logo type where the negative space almost creates this, this real sense of movement. And it's very simple. It's an addition of elements. And as you know, here when, when you get the I and a bit of an omission of parts of the letters here. So it's both this slight add and this slight taking away that uh, you know have this present an ability. Or an opportunity for the designer to to work with the negative uh, space, the counterform in an interesting way. Here's a simple, you know, combination of letters. The F in the case. Sometimes we can see letters within other letters, um, and you know, for logo types and letter marks, that kind of thing, um, that can be a, a useful tool. Here, it's almost more illustration oriented. Okay, and we do have an illustrated element, and the type is really just the negative space that works almost in support of the illustration itself. Here's a clunky old looking page, which I have kept since my earliest design school days. And it's still one of my favorite books. This is a book called Notes on Graphic Design and Visual Communication by Greg Berryman. And it's this page that has stuck with me for many years. Um, and this is all about spacing, letter spacing. And spacing like this, like I said, is sort of the essence of what we're doing with type. Um, essentially, when you get into letter spacing, you're considering the space between letters, OK? We tend to overuse the term kerning. When we're kerning, we're typically talking about, you know, selectively tweaking space between two characters, okay, at a time, you know, and then and then we'll, you know, we're looking at the type through an entire word or an entire line of type, but typically you're you're going in and reducing space between a pair of characters, okay, um, and in this case, if I was going to make a change, you would, you know, make your kerning adjustments here, your, your adjustments here, your adjustments here. And you know, you, typically you'll, you'll need to do this in maybe in headlines or logos. Anytime type is going to be used in a display, like the title of a book or the title of an album cover, you're not going to necessarily do it to an entire line of type. That would be, it just takes so much time, right? So um, I'm going to uh, have this page uh, available to you as a PDF so you can uh, download it and look at it uh, more in depth. But this is something that really struck with me, these two things. First of all, type is essentially made up of four types of strokes, okay? A vertical stroke, horizontal stroke, inclined or angled strokes, and these rounded cursive strokes, okay? So depending on what the word is that we're dealing with, um, you know, how those strokes work together can either present easier or more difficult uh, situations when it comes in, in down to spacing. So the first time, you, you know, you, like when you get a logo design project, you're just hoping, okay, well, I'm going to put this thing down on paper and just see what it looks like first, because how do the pairs of letters, you know, live together? And sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. But this idea of optical volumes is something that's always stuck with me. This idea of, you know, pouring equal amounts of sand or salt between the, the letters, you know, so thinking about it more from a volume standpoint uh, might help us to adjust our eye a little bit and get a sense of... Uh, and how, how, how we can work with the space between uh, the characters to get a more consistent sense of spacing. Um, and this is something that's often overlooked, okay? There are also, you know, like I talked about, combinations of letters. You can see here that the, you know, if you have two vertical strokes together, you'll, they'll oftentimes appear, uh, oftentimes appear a little bit tighter. You might want to open the space up a little bit. Um, if you're between two cursive strokes, sometimes it's an eyeball thing. You have to adjust it. It's, you know, you're not going to, you're not necessarily going to, 
open it up. You're not necessarily going to current it. It depends on the on the character of the, of the letters, but you're going to have to just kind of eyeball that. And sometimes you have you know extreme situations like this where there's nothing you can really do when the X and the Y meet at the top here. This negative space is there, so you're going to have to then probably as much as you can close that space up a little bit, okay? Just to compensate for the fact that you're automatically going to have a lot of negative space there, okay? Um, you know, we'll talk a little more about things like baseline. You know, the, the, the type sits on a baseline. And cursive strokes will always dip below the baseline. And, you, you know, this seems like a strange thing, but it's because you want that. And this is mentioned in your book as well. You will read about this. But if it doesn't, the scale of the type will start to look odd. Um, and, and we'll get more into that as we go. Um, here's some more, you know, we, we talk about letter spacing, word spacing is another one. That's something that I often see overlooked, especially in titles or in headlines. Um, you can see that, you know, it's not just a space between characters, but what are the, how are the spaces uh, between the words in the headline or the title? Uh, always remember to check those out. And line, sp line spacing is another huge, and we're, we're not there yet, but as we get into projects that involve more lines of type or some text, um, we're going to definitely be talking about line spacing. And you'll never want to use default line spacing in any uh, of the design programs. Um, it's typically too tight, and it needs to be adjusted. Okay, I'll let you guys look through that. So, I mean, I'll close with this. You know, the top is what you get oftentimes when you just type a word depending on the typeface. Some typefaces are, are spaced out automatically. They're drawn with spacing that's a little more friendly. Some are a little bit, you know, less detail-oriented that way. And so when I typed out yogurt in this particular typeface, what I got is exactly what you see on the top there, okay? And it's our job as designers uh, who are sensitive to type and spacing to make it look more like the bottom. Okay, so if you're going to get, you know, you're going to design a logo or you're putting a title on something and it's one word or multiple words, if you didn't consider the spacing and you submitted, you know, this, 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 an example like this one above here on the top, you know, that's bad news. We're not doing our job as a designer and, and, and there's enough of that visual, you know, clutter out there. We want to do the tight, refined, um, you know, more considered version. Okay, because like I said earlier in the, uh, in the, in our, class page, you know, one of the first signs of bad design is bad typography. And you know, when you see a portfolio of a student, and they might have a great use of color, they might have a uh, good use of imagery, you look at their type, and if it's not good, you keep going, you know. So just think about that. Uh, and so uh, that, that was just a quick overview of form and counterform. We'll get into some more discussions as we move through the next exercises. But uh, any questions you guys have, of course, let me know. Thanks.